I'm honestly not as cool as. Whoa, did everyone just hear that, or was that just me? Okay, everyone, everyone heard that. That's weird. Oh, you, cool. bro. Cool. Awesome, y'all. Well, first, thank you all so much for joining in. I see that we have people literally from all over the world. I'm so excited to talk about personal finance. Personal finance for me is a very, very personal and very exciting topic that I love to talk about. So today I'm going to teach every single one of y'all to become a millionaire. Who wants to become a millionaire? Type me in the chat. Otherwise, you can write a sad face and you can give me your money. Perfect, perfect. Awesome. Gianna, no worries. I, I see you. Perfect. All y'all, right? Think big. No, every single one of y'all can do this. I promise you. Well, I can't promise anything. I'm not a financial advisor, so please don't sue me, okay? Give me your money. Well, hey, let's share money, all right? I'll, you guys can give me your money first, and then I'll, I'll, dis, I'll, I'll disperse it to all y'all. So anyways, first, let's get into it. But before I talk, I, I have to do this. Um, I want to tell y'all that this is a very simplified version of personal finance, right? And this is not, um, I can't guarantee anything because I'm not a personal finance advisor, nor am I telling you to do anything. I'm simply offering suggestions and some of the research that I found to help y'all become more financially savvy. So with that, let's dive right into it. So if y'all can join, if y'all can just understand these three principles, I promise you, or I, with an asterisk, that you all to join the two comma club. What's a two comma club, y'all? What is a two comma club? No, not six figures, Joseph. Exactly, a millionaire, right? At the seven figures is the point where you can start having two fake two commas in your net worth. Yes, Joseph. Joseph, don't worry, man. Don't worry. You'll eventually get there. Okay. So live below your means. Invest the rest. Join the two comma club. Let's start right into it. Y'all excited? Type hashtag excited if y'all are excited for this chat. There we go. There we go. Yes, you'll all become future millionaires, Ami. All right, let's go. Let's go. Okay, cool. So first part, living below your means. At the end of the day, Google, stop that. At the end of the day, Every dollar that you have and have ever used functions in two main ways. You can either spend it or you can save it, right? Even if that dollar that, you're, that you have is sitting under in your wallet or you have a bucket where you just store all your savings, that is considered savings. It's not always investing or retirement. Even having cash on hand is considered saving. Spending really breaks down to three main things. Needs, wants, no values. Saving is stocks, bank, retirement funds. Really covers majority of the gamut. Maybe crypto, diamond hands, GameStop. Who, who invested in GameStop? Yeah, Andrew, okay. All right, here we go. Andrew's already a, mil Andrew's a first millionaire out of all of us. Okay, gotcha. Everyone, everyone go befriend Andrew so you can take some of his money. Just kidding. Cool. So let's, let's, let's talk about what each and every single one of these items are. Hopefully these are basic, but I'm going to quickly cover them. Needs and must-dos, right? It ultimately comes down to housing, transportation, food, and costs, or food and debt. If I were to ask y'all, how much money did you spend last month? Who can tell me exactly how much money they spent? Type me in the chat. Otherwise, you can type a sad face in the chat. Let's click in Kathleen. Okay, Andrew, right? A lot of y'all, right? 50K Darsh. All right, everyone befriend, befriend Darsh, probably a millionaire, right? Mint is your best friend. Perfect, right? The first step of understanding your personal finance is understanding where your money's going and where your money's going. So as you're thinking about personal finance, right? Use apps like Mint, YNAB. Use your own Google spreadsheet, right? I have one that I use on a Google form that links to Google spreadsheet. I can link the details uh, shortly afterwards. But the most important thing in personal finance is knowing where you are today. You don't know where you are today if you don't know where your money's going onto your spend, right? Similarly, need, wants, and desires, right? Again, I'm going to ask the same question. Who here can tell me how much money they've spent on clothes, traveling, maybe not traveling, entertainment, luxury goods? Anything else that sort of falls into the wants? Who here can tell me how much exact money that you spent a month ago, two months ago, 
three months ago. Type me in the chat. Otherwise, you can type it sad face in the chat. Okay, we got a lot more. Okay. Cool. Perfect. So y'all can tell me this, right? Perfect. Y'all are already on the step one. And the last but not least, this is the most dangerous item that y'all need to watch out for. No value items. What do you think are examples of no value items, y'all? What are examples of no value items? Or maybe what is a no value item? Does anyone have an idea? That is no value. All right, how do we kick Joseph out of the chat? Description you're not using exactly on me, right? I just bought an electric toothbrush. Hey, those are great investments, right? Yeah, something you're, you get, you're not using bubble tea, right? Whatever it is, right? At the end of the day, who here has spent money on things that, don't, that, that you don't really care about? Raise your hand. If you spent on money and things that you're like, yeah, I really didn't need that or didn't bring me any happiness, right? A lot of y'all, right? The no value items and the classic example that people use in their personal finance world is Starbucks, right? Who here has a Starbucks station? Raise your hand. It's okay. Yep, Andrew, of course, you're a millionaire, so that's okay, right? Boba's definitely need maybe a boba addiction, right? Y'all are being like, dang, boba, boba, boba. Okay, I know definitely Hannah drinks a lot of boba. I can see that she's just constantly thinking about it, right? <laughs> but it's things like this where you need to... The, one of the key principles of budgeting and living below your means is really identifying what are the things that make you happy and what are the things that don't make you happy. The more that you can align your money with where you or align your spend with what you're passionate about, that's a strong example of how you can live below your means, right? I feel I might be thinking, all right, Jerry, what does this actually mean, right? Let's go through an example. Meet Sarah. Sarah is 34. She's a high school teacher and is struggling with her finances. Every single one of y'all are going to be a financial advisor right now. Okay. A little bit about Sarah. She loves yoga. She loves cooking and she loves running. Those are, the, those are her three passions. Okay. She needs help. She's saying, Hey, I'm currently making about $1,500 a month and I'm currently spending $1,650 a month. Here's how my money breaks down. How do we help her? Share suggestions in the chat. Feel free to go off on mute. How do we help Sarah? No more roller coasters. Okay. Why, why, why no more roller coasters, Zachary? Why get rid of Six Flags uh, Pass? COVID. Yeah, Six Flags is not a passion. Riding roller coasters is not a passion. Cool. So we can get rid of Starbucks. Or sorry, uh, Six Flags. What else? Less money on the uh, take news subscription, bye-bye. Why, why should we get rid of the news subscription? Why should we get out of the news subscription? Forgotten, right? Who here has done a subscription and you literally forgot about it and you're like, oh my gosh, I, I, should, I, should, have, I should have canceled it. LinkedIn Premium, Netflix, Hulu, right? Or even like Chegg and you're like, oh, I get a free month or a free week. I'm gonna Google all my answers and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna dip out, right? So cool. So we identified six flags. We identified new subscription, right? Uh, Ping says mobile app, subscription, mobile app purchases. Why? Why mobile app purchases? Why should we get rid of mobile app purchases? Cookie clicker premium doesn't make her happy yet. Yeah? Go ahead, Darsh. I think you're muted, Darsh. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I think we can also consider looking into how we can save money where we are spending right now. So transportation, $100, restaurant, $100. Is there, are there ways to minimize those? Exactly, right? Regulated auto subscriptions could be positives, right? Just, especially if you're spending more money than you're earning, right? You probably want to get rid of the unnecessary things in your life, right? So these are some of the things that I highlighted, right? And if you can identify, hey, these are the things that are, I'm spending a lot of money on, you could cut her monthly expenses to 1365. If you can cut her monthly expenses to 1365, what happens to her finances? What happens to her finances?
up, up, up. She got extra money to save, invest, increase. Exactly. Right. She's finally out of the red. Right. But what if I told you this? This is all Sarah knew. She said, hey, I need help. How do we, how do we help her? How do we help Sarah if this is all we know? She can get more income, exactly. Get her one self dream job. <laughs> Thanks, Joseph. <laughs> right? But in this situation, Sarah literally cannot do anything because she doesn't know where her money's going. Right? So that is step number one. When you're thinking about living below your means, you have to understand what your monthly expenses are. If you don't know what your monthly expenses are, you're going to end up in this situation like Sarah, where you don't really know where your money's going, nor do you know how to help yourself. So the three main steps of budgeting, right? And let me go ahead and actually add my Medium article, because I actually... Uh, created a medium article in case people who don't like using online platforms. Um, here is how you can, uh, here is how you can use a process that I used uh, and I create on a Google form that leads to a Google spreadsheet. Everything is done for you. All you need to do is copy paste, right? You first wanna understand your spending habits, list out your priorities, it is so important for you to understand what your priorities are and making sure you sort of put your money where your mouth is, right? If you love going to music concerts, perfect. Go to all the music festivals. If you love luxurious items, perfect. Spend money on luxurious items. But if you, if you love luxurious items, why spend all your money on going to basketball games if you don't care for basketball? Why spend money on going to Coachella every year if you don't really care for music? Every, at the end of the day, everything is a trade-off. And as long as you know what, what, what makes you happy and you can then align your money to that, living frugally does not mean leave, living cheap. Living frugally just simply means that you're not willing to spend money on things you don't care about. And last but not least, of course, it moves on to our second step of investing the rest. Any questions so far? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Um, you can raise your hands if you have any question, and Jerry can call you. Cool. Otherwise, I'm going to move forward. Jerry, so you're talking in the article that you sent uh, a bunch of different tools, and you personally used Excel to kind of keep track of everything. Um, do you have like a personal favorite that you use, whether it be just manually through Excel or other uh, tools like Mint and such? Yeah, I personally don't like using Mint, YNAB, or all those other tools because I use Venmo a lot. And when I Venmo things, it says, oh, okay, let's say that Joseph and I go to dinner. I buy him Chipotle, or we go to Chipotle, I pay for it, and then Joseph Venmo's me $10, right? Mint will classify it as, oh, Jerry spent $20 at Chipotle, and he earned $10. For me, that doesn't help me provide as a, a little bit more as a detail of like how I spent my money. So I have to manually go into the tool, adapt, and so... I actually created a follow-up post of how to actually start budgeting in literally four minutes. I timed it. So that, that's how it was four minutes. Cool. Let's move forward. So investing the rest. I want to share with you guys a little story of Michael, Jennifer, and Sam. Or maybe we'll use real life people here. Uh, Andrew is going to be Michael. Darsh is going to be Jennifer. And Joseph is going to be Sam. Okay. So Andrew starts investing when he's 25 and he invests a thousand dollars every month until he's 35. And let's just say on average, uh, he, the market grow and he invests into the market. It grows roughly about 7%. After age 35, Andrew stops investing. Jennifer starts investing at 35, a thousand, same amount market grows the same rate. And she stops when she's 45. Same thing with her. Joseph, aka, so maybe I should just use his names. Michael invests when he's 25, stops investing when he's 35. Jennifer invests when she's 35, stops when she's 30, 45. Sam starts when he's 45, ends when he's 55. Every single one of them invested the same amount of money. 
but they all have different net worths. Why? As you guys can see here, right? Michael ended up, uh, by the time he's 65, at 1.5 million. Jennifer ended roughly seven, uh, 750,000. And Sam ended roughly at 375,000. If they all invested the same amount, what happened? Exactly, Andrew. Compound interest. Compound interest, Warren Buffett is the best example. Yes. This is point number one. When you're investing money, the most important thing that you can do with your money as you think about saving is starting early. Compounding interest is something that a lot of we learn in middle school and elementary school, but not many people actually go to take the time to apply it into their actual personal, into their actual finances. And, but you might be thinking, well, Jerry, how, how do I know what to invest in, right? If I invested in GameStop and, you know, I invested when it's high and now it's down, I lose money, right? This is a photo of the market performance. Yeah, exactly, to the moon, right? This is a, uh, a, a visualization of the market performance, right? And this is, uh, I believe this is on an exponential scale, a logarithmic scale. And this goes from like mid, like early, late 1800s all the way to 2000s, right? What are some of the things that you notice with this chart about the market movement? Upward trend. Yeah. On average, if you invest in a market, right? Steady growth, you're going to eventually get there. Right. And of course, if you actually use a, an actual scale, you're going to, the, the, the line would go above and above and beyond. Right. Because again, this is a logarithmic scale, it goes from 10, 100, 1000 to 10,000. So in actuality, it kind of goes like this. Right. But why is it that most people lose money in the market? If the market goes up on average, why do most people lose money in the market? Short term investing, they pull money out when it drops. It's about time in market. It's not about timing the market, staying in market. They try to time the market exactly. One of the biggest things about investing is that most people buy high and they sell low. Why is that? Because most people, when they see that they have a 200% gain, they're like, oh my gosh, I have a 200% gain. I better keep riding this. Historical performance has gone up really high. So that should mean that it's going to keep going up, right? But imagine that that's, that investment drops 90% the next month. And you're like, oh my gosh, I just lost all my money. I don't want to be at $0. And so people have a tendency to pull out, right? And I want to share with you an actual example of, of Warren Buffett, right? Warren Buffett had a, uh, a challenge to hedge funds. And for those people who don't know what hedge funds are, Hedge funds are those people who make millions and millions of dollars every month, and they uh, pretty much take people's money and they invest it into you know bonds, equities, you know whatever it is, derivatives, and they say I, I can try to beat the market. Warren Buffett challenged a number of different hedge funds, and they said, and he said, I will literally donate a million dollars to your charity if you can beat the market performance over an eight-year time frame. Warren Buffett said, I'm going to put in whatever amount of money into an index fund that tracks the market performance and all you other hedge funds, you can invest however you want. If you can beat me, I'll pay you a million dollars or a billion dollars, one of the two. Guess what happened? Here's my man Warren Buffett, right? What does this chart on the left-hand side uh, show you? What does a chart on the left-hand side show you? He won. Yeah. Warren Buffett literally beat the bet of five with five different hedge funds. Warren Buffett pulled through. Over an eight-year period, roughly, right? Warren Buffett's index, index fund performance. And again, all he did was investing into the S&P 500. Every single one of y'all can invest into the S&P 500 today. 
over an eight year time, nine year time frame, he got roughly an 85% return. Everyone else ranged from 2.9% to 62% over that nine year period. Crazy, right? There's a, there's a, there's a study done by, uh, by a research firm and guess what percentage of hedge funds don't beat the market over a 10 year period? What percent of hedge funds do not beat the market performance? 100%, 80%, any other guesses? Over a long term period, what percentage of hedge funds don't beat them? It's right in the middle between those two numbers. Roughly about 90% of hedge funds do not beat market performance. When I read that set, I thought that was crazy. And when I saw this, it sort of validated a hypothesis for me, right? And so you have to think, okay, so if people who get paid millions and millions of dollars, they have access to every single research out there about every company performance, government decisions, bonds, right? every single thing. They have a team of analysts that try to understand and predict market movement who also get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. If 90% of them cannot beat the market. The question I think about is what makes, you, what makes me think I can do better than a team of hedge fund analysts and hedge fund managers? And how do I know that I can beat the market performance over the long period of time? How do I know that? And so who here's on TikTok or, in, or Instagram Reels? Who here's on TikTok? Some of y'all, right? Who here has seen those per those finance gurus who go, y'all? I told you, I predicted the I, I predicted the stock. It went up one hundred sixty percent. I told y'all. Who who's heard of them? A lot of y'all, right? Do you guys ever wonder why they don't take out a million? If they if they can truly beat get one hundred sixty percent, do you guys ever wonder why they don't just take out a million dollar loan from the bank? and just invest that, that million dollars and get 160% return? Why don't they do that? Why don't they invest their entire life savings into that? Why don't they sort of get all the money from their friends? Say, I'll guarantee you a 50% return if you give me that money because I know I can get 200% returns over the next month. Why don't they take out loans and invest millions of dollars? Banks make it really hard, yeah. But the fact of the matter is, is that they know they don't show you the times that they're wrong. Survivorship bias is one of the most important things in personal finance that I think all y'all just need to know about. Survivorship bias is this huge, is this concept of you only hear about the stories because they live long enough to tell it. Typically, people don't post, hey guys, I've gotten a negative 36% return in the past three years. Let me show you what I did. People don't typically post, I only got a 2% return over five years. Let me show you some of the strategies I posted. Why? Because they're not sexy topics, right? So then comes to the question, they really should. Yeah, maybe if, maybe if some of y'all are investors and you guys can beat the market or maybe you guys, don't want, you guys don't beat the market, you guys should post about it, right? It'll humanize the investing world, right? But you guys might be thinking, well, Jerry, then what do I invest in, right? The biggest thing that I want all y'all to know about is diversification. And I think about in a forest, right? Individual stocks, AKA investing in AMC, AKA investing in um, Google, investing in Apple. You're investing in a small leaf in hopes that that leaf will eventually blow up. You might be thinking, okay, well, maybe I believe in Google. Maybe I believe in Apple, right? But I... But what you're essentially doing is you're hoping that this one leaf eventually blows up. Investing in mutual funds, instead of investing in one leaf, now you're investing in an entire tree, right? Some of the leaves may fall, but some of the leaves may blossom, right? And maybe seeds is probably a better example, right? But still, you're only investing in one tree. Uh, a, someone who hates the forest can come down and chop down that one tree. And now all your returns are gone, right? But what's even better is you could invest into the frick 
the freaking entire forest, right? And that's what index funds are. Index funds pretty much means that you are investing in every single company that are out there today. Or maybe you're investing in the top 500 company companies in the world. Maybe top 500 companies of the US, top 500 companies internationally, right? When you're thinking about putting money into investments, I always want you to think about this. Should I invest into a single leaf? Should I invest into a single tree? Or should I invest into the freaking forest? What you have to believe is for index funds not to be not to not to be uh, not to do well is that you have to imagine something to burn down literally every single tree in that forest. Similar in, in the actual world, you have to believe that the top five hundred companies that exist today will not be there next year. You have to imagine a world where Google, Apple, Facebook, Netflix, all of these other companies, Tesla, will not exist ne exist next year. Hard to believe. So when you're investing in index funds, that's what you're doing. You're investing in the entire forest, not a tree, not a single leaf, but the freaking forest. Navashini asks, what's the difference between investing in index fund ETFs? Uh, index funds typically follow uh, the market movement. So you can invest into the US market, for example. ETFs can uh, are basically electronic traded funds, uh, but they could be like, you could track the tech index fund. So all the tech companies that exist in the US as an example, right? So again, you might not, you might want to, you might want to invest in the entire forest, but also you might want to just say, you know what? I believe that the tech fund, the tech industry is going to continue to blow up. So I'm going to invest in every single tech company that exists there today. That's an example of investing in one line of trees. Great question. At the end of the day, y'all, if you invest in the market, time in market beats timing in market. I want y'all to type this out because this is one of the core principles of personal finance, right? Time in market beats timing in market. I literally want every single one of y'all to type this out in the chat, right? Because people typically have a tendency to say, oh my gosh, the market has gone down. Now I'm going to buy. Oh, hey, the market has... Love it. Love Nicole, Andrew, Joseph, Tashin, right? Bin Lop, Darsh. Love y'all that you posted it, right? All y'all love it. The reason why time in market beats timing in market is because there are going to be times when you invest in the highs, right? There are going to be times when you invest high, but there's also going to be times when you invest low in the market, right? As long as you're consistent. This is a chart that shows uh, over uh, if you invest into the U.S. market and you just held it. And I believe this, this research looked at the past 100 to 150 years or something, something around that range. And they looked at for every period in time, if you in, for every single year, if you bought a stock, right, how many, what will your performance be if you uh, plotted every single year? That's what each, each uh, green line represents, right? So for example, let's say I, I bought it this year, after year five, I'm roughly going to have a high probability of me roughly 1.5 xing my returns. What's one thing that you notice as you sort of move from year zero to year 40? What's one thing that y'all notice? Increase. Linear growth, yep. But y'all, look at this, right? If you're below this one line, that means you've lost money, right? What's special about year 20? What's special about year 20? Is there anything special about year 20 here? It is literally above the line. So if you looked at the past 100 years and you held your stocks for 20 years, there's literally no chance that you'd have lost money if you held it for 20 years. And that chance grows even higher once you hit year 40. There's a chance that it could, it could have boomed, right? Depending on the year that you've invested, right? But there's also a chance that it would have gone really down. 
But after year 20, sort of that sweet spot of you're, you're going to be net positive or at least even, right? And an inverse of this, right? Chance of losing money in a stock. What do you guys notice, notice here? What do y'all notice here? What does this chart tell you? Decrease, yeah. Risk decrease over time. But look, this time in market, these timing in market, right? Yes, Nicole, right? Roughly around the 20 years mark, you pretty much have almost a 0% chance of losing the market, unless the market performance were to be significantly different than it has been for the past 150 years. So what is a recap here? For all y'all who want to become millionaires, you have to understand where your money's going. And you have to make sure that you understand, hey, am I spending a lot of my money on things that I actually enjoy? Or am I splitting, am I putting all my money on things I don't care about? Right. And similarly, what percentage of my income am I actually saving? The second thing, time in market beats timing in market. Investing, you want to go for the long run. You do not want to go for 150% gain in the, in the next three weeks. Sure, that's great, but can you do that for the next 40 years? History. Research has shown you have a 90% chance of losing. You have a 90% chance of not performing than, than you just investing money into the market. Investing is a marathon, not a sprint. And if all y'all can start today, if all y'all can start taking some of these practices, internalizing it for yourself and saying, you know what? I'm going to start investing 10 bucks a month. I'm going to start investing 100 bucks a month. I'm going to start investing $1,000 a month. Whatever that, whatever that amount that you're comfortable is, right? By the end of it all, by the time we're all 50, 40, 30 for some of us, or even, even 60 or 70 for all of us, we'll event, I'll see y'all at the Two Comma Club. I have a bunch of uh, books that I, that I absolutely love to uh, read. The one I highly, highly recommend is A Simple Path to Wealth by Jella Collins, which is the second one here. Um, let me actually show you this. Uh, JL Collins actually published it for free uh, because he's such a good guy. Um, so for those people who, who are thinking about, Jerry, you still haven't convinced me. JL Collins has published all his research, has predicted pretty much like everything of the question that you could ask. Oh, Jerry, well, what if, Ro what if Vanguard goes down? What if I invest my money to Robinhood and Robinhood were to disappear? What if the US government were to suddenly shut down? What's gonna happen to my money? He literally has everything for free on that website that I just shared with y'all. And with that, I hope y'all learned something today. I love talking about personal finance, as you can tell. Um, thank you for your time and attention. Let me know if you have any questions. Hey, can we get like a nice round of applause through the reactions for Jerry? That was amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, Nicole, I love talking about personal finance. I have another workshop of like, um, how do you think about uh, retiring and all that stuff? So like, yes, I absolutely love, love, love talking about um, personal finance. Yeah, we have about 20 minutes left of the event here. And so if you have any questions, if you want to take a look at the slides one more time, I want you to go back, feel free to raise your hand like Nicole's doing and we'll just start calling and you can just ask directly to Jerry. Yeah. Hey. Hey, Jerry, I have a question. Um, and this is more about uh, the tools that you use for going about personal finance. And I know there are many tools out there, Robinhood, Fidelity Investments, but just wanted to get an idea. Like, let's say if you get a paycheck of three, four thousand uh, dollars every month, like and I want to invest like thousand dollar every month somehow into something via something and i'm a total noob i have no idea what, what to use what advice would you have like what should i look into for that cool. so the easiest way that you can start is opening up a brokerage account it's free doesn't cost a single dime go on to vanguard.com charles schwab goldman sachs every bank has sort of their own brokerage account i recommend vanguard because they have the industry leading um they lead in the industry in terms of expense ratio. So you pay the least amount of money when you invest in things. Surprise for most people, 
uh, let me go ahead and go back. Uh, when you invest in index funds, you have to pay a percentage of the money that you put in because as a service fee for you to invest into that index fund, that's how they make money. The percentage is really small. It's not 5%, it's 0.05%, 0.02%, et cetera. So I highly recommend for those people who want to start today, uh, start looking into opening up a brokerage account, right? There's ways that you can tax shelter your account, IRAs, 401ks, HSAs. I'm not going to, I'm not going to make it more complicated than it needs to be. Brokerage account, invest into an index fund. The way that you know whether or not an index fund is good is you should see if it tracks the S&P 500. So just look at the performance as an example. Couple ones that I really like are uh, VTSAX uh, is a good one. I believe it's, uh, I think it's VOO is also a good one. VTI is also a good one. Um, and those are all Vanguard specific funds. So a lot of y'all, if you're gonna invest, right? Uh, just look at the look at the market performance, look at the like little waves and stuff or the performance. And that's the only thing you need to invest in. If you wanna get more risky, that's a whole personal choice. But for me, I, simply, I don't wanna ever make investing a job. So I invest into the market simply and I never have to worry about it again. Can you say that again about mocking the performance index similar to S&P 500? Yeah, so uh, let me go ahead and just share my screen actually. So one of the things that you should just look at is to just look at uh, the, to see whether or not it tracks an index, right? It should, it should tell you in the name, right? But if you're like, oh, this is, this is way too much here. I don't know, I don't know how this, I don't know how to look at this. Uh, then just look at the sort of this like wave here. If you want to look at my portfolio, it literally is just VTSAX, international funds and bonds. That's literally the three things I invest in. Um, Bogle heads, three fund portfolio. If you're like, Jerry, I, you're still confusing me. Here, I'll give you a link for y'all. Uh, this is what they recommend. A question that you guys might be thinking, right? is Jerry, uh, why, why should I invest into the US market? Doesn't that mean I'm only being exposed to US companies? That's a bad thing, right? You, I thought you talked about investing into the entire forest, right? The pushback I have there is what percentage of Google's revenue, for example, do you think is just purely US? Almost every Fortune 500 company is an international company right? A big proportion of Google's revenue comes internationally. And I can guarantee you the same thing for every other Fortune 500 company. So yes, you're investing in a U.S. company, but that U.S. company's business performance is dependent on international uh, countries as well. Cool. Nicole, uh, do you have a question for Jerry? Yes. First of all, thank you so much for making this so accessible and understandable. Yeah. And the second thing I was going to say is um, usually I'm scared about the things that I don't know too much about. And one of the reasons why I haven't started investing is because I don't know what's going to happen with my taxes. So I'm just wondering if there's any specific resource, just like you're sharing these books, where you learn more about how that could impact your taxes and how to do it in a way that is the best. Yeah, so um, I think for most people, so I heard the saying by Kevin O'Leary. Who watches Shark Tank? Does anyone know Kevin O'Leary from Shark Tank? Cool. Uh, there was an interview that he did and one person asked him, well, hey, how, how do I sort of manage my money because I'm so worried about taxes and all the stuff? And he, one of the things that he said was very true. He said, once you start worrying about taxes, that's when you know you sort of made it. That's sort of, that's sort of like a rich person problem, right? So in terms of taxes, oh my gosh, am I going to tax short-term short -term capital gains, long-term capital gains, right? Like I wouldn't even worry about that. The main thing that I want you to focus on is just put money in the market. By you putting money to the market, you are not being taxed at all, actually. The only thing that you're going to be taxed on is when you take money out. So if, unless you have plans to take money out, then there, there's a taxable event. But by putting money into a brokerage, there's nothing that you have to worry about taxes. Thank again, you. yes. Yep. And again, like there, there are ways to afford it for you to sort of tax shelter your money into tax, tax advantage accounts, uh, 401ks, HSAs, 
uh, five, five oh, 512 Bs or something for your teacher. Oh no, 403 Bs if you're a teacher, right? There's a lot of these other things that you can invest in that's tax sheltering, IRAs, but like that's how you, that's, that's when you know that like you've already, you've already mastered step one. Step one is to get money to the market. Stop worrying about taxes. Step two is to worry about taxes. Cool. Um, Iris, what's up? Hey, Jerry. Thanks so much for this session. I've, I've always heard that you are so passionate about personal finance, and this is very helpful. Um, yeah. So I wonder, uh, I've been pretty passionate about ESG related stuff. So I wonder, do you know if there are any like ESG related index fund? And also another question following up on the taxes. So I'm, I'm kind of, uh, well, I'm, I'm thinking of the tax problem because I also invest in cryptocurrencies and uh, I'm not too sure how I would need to calculate the costs and the gains. Uh, so any, any tips on like how you calculate your, um, how much amount you're taxed on? Yeah, uh, I would just honestly go use it. Uh, was it a registered agent? Shoot, now this is gonna bug me. Registered agent. Um, so you can either go to an enrolled agent. So there's, there's two types of people you can go for your taxes. CPAs, AKA, like these are people who have like accounting degrees, like they work at PwC or whatever. You can also go to an enrolled agent. Enrolled agent are people who sort of help you with taxes, but they don't, they don't handle like complex situations. I highly recommend you look into an enrolled agent and just ask them about all those tax questions. Because to be honest, like, I'm just like, I know my tax situation really well, but I don't want to sort of advise on taxes because I just not I just don't know your situation as well. So, just talk to an enrolled agent. In terms of uh, ESG funds, to be honest, like I I would just keep it simple and just invest in the market. If you want to become rich in the long term, that's really the only thing I'd recommend. Okay, so I mean if. It kind of makes sense that you only invest in three index funds, but how do you know that these three are not overlapping with each other too much? I, I'm I'm sure you did your research, but like, yeah. yeah. So, so if you if you if you looked at the link that I sent you, the three index fund portfolio, you you invest in three main things. You invest in U.S. domestic large cap equities, aka S and P five hundred top U.S. companies. Second thing I invest in is international top companies. Everything outside of the U.S. And the last thing I invest in are bonds, right? Bonds pretty much are just like a way to sort of uh, minimize the movement within your performance, right? But they're like, they're pretty much like government loans. So those are the three things I invest in. The reason why I know they don't, they overlap is that they're, they're pretty much mutually exclusive, right? Yeah. A company cannot be, a, a thing that I invest in cannot be a bond and a company. A company that, a thing I invest in cannot be an international company and a US company at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. What about small cap? I feel like small cap, people have talked about it, but. Yeah, there's mid cap, small cap, goes back to just risk tolerance, right? The more sort of risky you become, the more movement you're gonna see in your, in your portfolio. So it's personal preference. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much. Cool. Yeah, and I saw there are a, a lot of questions on uh, above. So uh, let me sort of go through them. Um, how do you choose an index fund? Yeah, we just talked about it. I just gave you some resources. Thoughts on cryptocurrency. Uh, it's the same thing I think about the, the, the tree analogy, right? C cryptocurrency is a way for you to invest in, a, in an elite. It can do really well. It can also just go horribly wrong. Um, opinions on FIRE. Yes, I'm a huge part of the FIRE community. F for those people who don't know, FIRE is uh, an acronym for Financially Independent Retire Early, Right. That, and this is a small knit community of people who pretty much maximize the amount of money that they save, right? They budget heavily. They maximize every single dollar that they save so that they can retire when they're like 35. So yeah, I'm a huge proponent of that movement. Highly, highly recommend for people to look into it. Uh, uh, thoughts on ARC? I actually haven't heard of ARC. Let me Google what that is. Uh, yeah. Hey, Jerry, a quick question while that um, you talked a bit about taxing during investment. And I, I'm aware like there are different tax brackets, short term, long term. Can you talk a bit about that? Because I'm pretty sure like most people may not know that. Yeah. Um, 
yeah so uh, so to answer the arc thing i actually don't know much about arc to be honest to be honest y'all like just keep it simple um in terms of the tax situation like in my mind again i'm not a tax lawyer or anything so like don't take whatever what i say like golden rules these are just directional information that i know uh second first short-term capital gains if you buy a stock and you sell it then if you buy a stock and you hold it for less than a year and you sell it, you have to pay a higher percentage of your gains, right? So let's say you went from $100 to $150, you're taxed on that $50 gain. So Long-term capital tax is if you hold a stock or, or, or uh, an investment or security for more than a year, you're only taxed, I believe, at 10% or 20%, one of the two. So it's just a lower, there's advantages of you investing in something for longer than a year. There's a tax, tax benefit. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, there's a question about REITs. Um, JL Collins, so personally for me, um, I believe real estate are one of the worst investments that you can make. Um, and a lot of people might go, oh my gosh, what do you mean? I see a lot of people on TikTok who buys multiple houses and they're like quadrillionaires. Um, JL Collins has this really nice article that summarizes why you should never invest in real estate. Um, let me see if I can find it. Here we go. Um, this, this sort of outlines why buying houses is a sort of terrible investment. Um, and typically it is more of an emotional one than it is a, a financial one. So uh, for those people who are thinking about being like, oh my gosh, I want to buy a... a you know, a house or whatever. Yeah, some people can make it work, but again, survivorship bias, very, very strong in the real estate world. Every finance YouTuber I've watched has a housing, housing phase. Yes, gone through it. Yep. Of course, of course, of course. Any other questions? Any questions? Anything else? Cool, Darsh, thanks for summarizing that, man. Uh, Lillian Zhang, rental properties. Yes, I do not recommend, rent, uh, personally for me, I will never do rental properties. The reason why you never do rental properties is sort of uh, sort of do like uh, what I just mentioned, right? Like, like in that article I mentioned, but TLDR of rental properties is that it pretty much becomes a job for you as a landlord. You become a landlord if you start doing rental properties. If you don't want to become a landlord and you can sort of ship it off to a management company, then that's something you lose 2% of your gains, 3% of your gains every month. Right. So I personally would not recommend it. Opinions on apps like Betterment. Uh, if you can show me a fund from Betterment or if you can show me per performance on Betterment that has outperformed the market over a 30 year time period, I'll love Betterment. I'll love whatever app that you sort of do. But for me, I haven't seen a, a fund performance that out outperforms the market um, over the long term for any of those apps and stuff. The key thing to know about Auden Robo investing and stuff is you should look into how, what percentage of money do they take from you, right? So let's say that there is Betterment, for example, manages your money for you. And they'll say, hey, I, I want to take 0.5% or 1% of your funds or of your, of your gains. That's so much money because what you should expect on a market is roughly 6 to 8%. If you can go even 1% more, think about that compounding interest, Right. So I would, I personally do not recommend uh, robo advisors. I do not recommend financial advisors uh, just because they're, they cut into your gains over a long-term period. You're going to be better off by just investing into the market. Mm -hmm. What are some principles that help me on a budget without being too rigid? Uh, the principles I have budgeting is being flexible. The, you know that you've gone too much on budgeting. If you're constantly thinking about money, if you're like, shoot, like, am I going to be able to eat Chipotle today? Let me check my, let me check my budget. Right. If you feel like you're, you're way too much, like if you feel like that it's money stressing you out, you need to lax on your budget. Uh, uh, Andrew says, I have friends who use apps like Acorns, literally pay a monthly fee. Yes. Uh, don't pay a monthly fee. Y'all like just invest in a market. That's how you become rich. Jerry, Jerry I had a question real quick about kind of dividing up your budget. And so say that your net worth is a hundred dollars, right? How much of that hundred dollars would be put into your brokerage slash investing? How much of it do you have in like hard cash in your checkings account? How much of that do I save for my emergency fund? How do you yes. break that down? Great question. So there's this uh, Reddit personal finance uh, flow chart. 
there's this flow chart on Reddit. And this is like the best flow chart I've ever seen of how to manage your money. So everything you just said, Joseph, is answered by this, by this one um, flow chart. Can you explain tax gains harvesting? Oh my gosh, that, man, that's a very specific question, Jen. I hope you do not do this. Uh, but the concept of tax gains harvesting is that like when you sort of, uh, when you sort of lose money, right, on the market, you could write those, right, you can write your losses off as deductions, right? Um, and the whole concept of tax loss, tax gains harvesting is to sort of optimize for that. So let's say that you invest in Google, not like a big percentage of Google's money comes from ads, right? If ads do well, they're going to do well. If it doesn't, then you lose money. The whole purpose is that let's say that Google goes through a horrible PR crisis and, they, and their stock goes down but you still believe in the digital ads industry. What you can do is you can sell Google stock, sort of realize those tax deductions at those losses and buy Facebook instead. Facebook is a very similar, similar company to Google because they make majority of the money on Google ad, or on, on digital ads. That's the whole purpose of like tax loss, tax gains, harvesting. Um, again, like I don't, I don't recommend that just because like it becomes a job at that point. And again, managing your money should never become a job unless you actually want to get into finance. 50, 30, 20 rule. That's also a good one. This cool. I want to take a photo if that's cool with y'all from my Instagram. Do y'all want to be on my Instagram? Yeah. Everyone's like, cool. Perfect. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to take a photo um, for all y'all. And again, y'all can follow me on I am Jerry with three R's. Don't ask me why it's not two R's. Um, there's a very sad story behind that. Um, all right, y'all say cheese. One, two, three. Cool, y'all. Awesome. Well, y'all, I hope y'all learned a little something today. If there's one thing that I recommend that y'all do, if there's one takeaway, just put money away into the market. Putting money away to the market is the easiest way that you become rich. And I hope to see y'all at the Two Comma Club. Cool? And let me know if you want me to do more of these. I, I like love doing these, so. Yes. Thank you so much, Jerry. For everyone, if that was helpful, let's give him another round of applause through the Zoom claps. Uh, be sure to find him on Instagram. You have to tag that by his name. Find him on LinkedIn. Jerry, he writes uh, amazing content, uh, both on TikTok, Instagram Reels, as well as on LinkedIn. So definitely go shoot him a follow. And this recording also will be available soon on our Product Buzz YouTube page. So if you ever want to refer back to it, uh, it'll be there. And I've also kept the links to the different blogs and the different resources that Jerry sent along the way. So you'll get forwarded that to, towards your email. But thank you all for again attending. This was amazing. Thank you, Jerry. And yeah, I hope cool. you all have a great rest of your week. See y'all. Bye, everybody.